Hello, welcome along. I'm Justin Briley, your host for Unbelievable this Saturday afternoon. Between now and four o'clock, we're aiming to get you thinking. This is the talking shop for Christians and non-Christians. We do all kinds of debates, history, philosophy, theology, the Bible. Today, it's science. Very exciting program for you, and I'll be telling you more about it in just a moment's time. Let me remind you that Unbelievable is part of your Saturday lineup of programming that aims to get you thinking, and straight after today's show, between four and five, you can join me again for the profile interview. My guest today is Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 Prayer Movement. So look forward to that between four and five this afternoon. Don't forget, though, you can find Unbelievable, this program, and many past programmes and extra resources at the website. That's premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Let me introduce today's topic and my guests. You're unbelievable. Well, today we're debating intelligent design and the evolutionary record, asking does the explosion of life forms in the Cambrian era uh, provide evidence for intelligent design over evolution. And what is the Cambrian era? Well, if you don't know, you're about to find out. Um, Darwin's Doubt is the name of the new book by Stephen C. Meyer. He's a leading intelligent design theorist with the Discovery Institute. And it's all about the explosive origin of animal life and what Stephen believes is the case for intelligent design that emerges from it. Well, in conversation with Stephen today is Charles Marshall. He's professor of biology at the University of California in Berkeley and has written a scathing review of the book and of the intelligent design movement generally in Science magazine. He's titled it When Prior Belief Trumps Scholarship. So we're in for a good debate today, I think. Uh, This is always uh, an issue that has great interest, I know, to listeners. Um, So it's good to have both of you gentlemen on the line today. Um, Let's just briefly say hello, first of all, to Steve. Steve, um, thank you for joining me today. It's great to be with you, Justin. Um, Steve, uh, it's been a while since your last book, maybe a couple of years um, since Signature in the Cell. You're you're back with another controversial blockbuster, aren't you? Um, We're going to find out all about it in a moment's time. Um, Good to have you on the show today. Just a brief hello as well to Charles Marshall. Yeah, and and for me as well. Okay. (laughs) Charles, um, thank you for coming on the show today. Good morning. A pleasure to be here. Yes, well, it's morning for you, afternoon for us. But um, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> thank you very much for, for being on the show. Um, uh, we're going to be finding out about your, your views on this as well. Um, so appreciate you joining me on the show today. Now, just um, a little bit different to normal on the program today. We're actually going to be giving over the whole show to this debate. We just felt there was so much to talk about. We'll dispense just for this week with our normal feedback uh, of your views at the end of the show. So um, in the first part, we're going to give plenty of time for Stephen to outline his issues and uh, to outline the the thesis of the book really and then for Charles to give a sort of fairly detailed response and then we'll we'll launch into the discussions thereafter so um, Steve first of all um, take us back to um, the, the title of this book Darwin's Doubt what is that actually referring to you bet. It re- well, it refers to a concern that Darwin raised about the evidential record in relation to his own theory. Um, the, the, the doubt that he had was not so much about whether his theory was true, but whether it could explain a particular class of evidence uh, known as the, the Cambrian explosion. And the Cambrian explosion refers to an event in the history of life when we find a uh, discontinuous or abrupt appearance of the first major groups of animals. And Darwin was aware of this in his time, and what the book does, uh, in, in fact, and he, he acknowledged that this was a, uh, uh, it posed, a, as he put it, a valid objection to the views here entertained. Uh, he, of course, expected that the fossil record would show the gradual emergence of complex animal life from simpler uh, pre-existent forms. And he also expected that the mechanism of natural selection acting on random variation would work very slowly and gradually on small incremental variations. He realized that if the variations from one generation to the next were too large, uh, they would cause deformities and the resulting organisms would die and terminate the evolutionary process. So he envisioned a very slow, gradual process producing complexity. And yet the fossil record in the Cambrian period attests to this very abrupt appearance. 
and uh, and so he acknowledged that this was a, a as, as I said before, a valid objection to the views here entertained in his Victorian English. So this was the doubt that he had. That, he, that was the doubt, and what the book does is not so much focus on the history of that, though I tell an op- I have an opening chapter that does, but it, I really trace that doubt and show how it's grown up to produce a significant conceptual difficulty in evolutionary theory. Uh, not just about the missing fossils, but also uh, a, a problem. In fact, I look at two b- mysteries in the book. The, the first is the problem of the missing fossils, the missing ancestral forms uh, that were expected on Darwin's view. But I also look at what I think is the more profound and uh, significant difficulty, which is the the, uh, the difficulty of macroevolution, or uh, putting it in slightly engineering terms or bioengineering terms. It's the question of how would you how would the evolutionary process build these complex animals? Mm. It's uh, mm. essentially the question of what caused these things to come into existence. And and, and this is uh, treading fairly different ground in a way to what you did in Signature in the Cell, which is all about origin of life and and how did before any kind of evolutionary process kicks in where did this information that that started it all off come from this, well, this is, it, 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 well it's linked but 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 a, a little bit of a different sort of scope yeah there, there, there there's a connection because in the second part of the book which is really begins to outline the main argument of the book uh, i i describe the the informational requirements of building a a cambrian animal and, um, and and the great discovery of the second half of the 20th century in modern biology is that is that information is is running the show in biological systems. That you need information to to if you, if you want to. In the first book, I showed that if you wanted to build a uh, uh, the, the first living cell from simpler pre-existing chemicals, you had to have information. You had to have the information that in the, in the DNA. But the the same thing is true at the higher level. If you want to build new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms of life. There are informational requirements, and uh, and so since since Watson and Crick, since the, the their their uh, Crick's fame sequence hypothesis, in which he uh, proposed that the the four um, chemical bases along the spine of the DNA molecule are actually functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a section of machine code, we've realized that. Uh, at the very least, we need this digital information to build the proteins uh, that are in turn necessary to build uh, specific cell types, which are in turn necessary to various tissues and organs and finally body plans. When we get to the Cambrian period, what we have arising are novel body plans. But you can't build a body plan without at least genetic information. And I show in the book that there are... Uh, there are other forms of information in living systems as well, uh, forms that are now being called epigenetic information by people in developmental mm. biology. And you need both of these types of information to build an animal. So the, the, the crucial question that the Cambrian uh, brings into focus is what caused the origin of the information necessary to build these complex forms of animal life. And, and just, just to give us a, an idea for those of us who aren't familiar with the Cambrian explosion, um, w- what kind of creatures suddenly appeared on the scene and and how were they very different to what we have previous to that in the fossil record well the um, uh, Darwin was aware of, of two main forms uh, the, the famed trilobite which fascinated me as a, as a child um, with its uh, compound eye and uh, articulated ex- exoskeleton with the three distinct lobes uh, he was also aware of brachiopods uh, a bivalve with a complex um, internal anatomy but uh, Pretty much, we now know, and this is one of the things that has made the the mystery uh, even more mysterious, is that s- most of the major animal body plans uh, first arose in the Cambrian. One of the great finds in China has shown now that even fish go as far back a- as the Cambrian. Echinoderms arise in the Cambrian. Uh, you just go across the range of the the known phyla, the largest division of biological classification, which correspond roughly to unique uh, body plans, where a body plan is a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. And um, uh, by, you know, there's various ways of estimating this, but uh, uh, in the book I made a a careful count as best I could from the various technical papers on this. And uh, if there are 36 known phyla roughly, and one way of counting, um, 27 of those have been fossilized, 20 of those first appear in the Cambrian. There are three other phyla that are in the Cambrian that appear 
a bit earlier in the Precambrian. So it's a very a pattern of pervasive discontinuity as far mm. as these higher level forms arising. Yes, and and so the question you ask is where are these missing fossils if the evolutionary story is, is right? True? And that that's that's the first third of the book, and it's an inter- that, that was the mystery that intrigued yeah, Darwin. But yeah. what I what I really get to is what we've already talked yeah. about. The, where where the, did the, 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 yeah? This, this... How do you build the, the, the essential <laughs> question is how do you build these animals? How mm, would the evolutionary mm, process mm. generate all that information that's necessary to build those forms of life? And and we're talking about 530 million years ago, sort of the the Cambrian explosion when all these new forms that's, came and, and yeah, and 530 so on. to 520. That's a, t- a typical dating for it. So there's some. Um, uh, subjectivity in this, depending on how many separate events people want to define as as uh, the, the explosion, uh, but that that's a, uh, the, the the period that yeah. most oftentimes attracts the attention of paleontologists. So, having questioned whether neo-Darwinian processes, as it were, can can account for all this new material, body plans, uh, the g- g- genetics involved in in getting to that point, um, what, what what's your positive case then for intelligent design on the back of that? Well, may, may I first explain the, the, some of the critical cases? Just mm. stating that there are informational requirements doesn't ex- explain why neo-Darwinism has had such a difficult time accounting for that. So if I could just wedge in an, a- an answer to a question you didn't ask and then come back yeah, to that. Absolutely, go ahead. Help. Yeah. And, and let's take, for example, the, 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 the both genetic and epigenetic requirements. Um, to build a new gene... It turns out to be a very difficult thing as a result of a, of a, by relying on random mutation. A simple analogy it makes sense to us out here in Redmond. We've got Microsoft here. If you start changing at random uh, sections of a established computer code, um, you ask yourself a question: Are you more likely to degrade the information that's there, or to generate a new uh, software program or operating system? Well. Obviously, it's it's the latter. You're going you're going to degrade the information. Now, the question is why, and, and the answer is that in all typographic systems, uh, whether we're talking about digital code or the alphabetic system of the English language, it turns out that there are vastly more ways to rearrange the relevant characters that in 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 a way that does not perform a function, than there are to arrange the characters in a way that does perform a function. And uh, mathematicians and uh, computer scientists who became interested in the the whole issue of uh, evolutionary theory back in the 1960s began to raise questions about the plausibility of the Darwinian mechanism because they realized that this this tendency to degrade information with random changes was really a significant problem. But the question was essentially how rare or how common are these uh, functional sequences among all the other possibilities. And in the case of DNA, you've got instead of zeros and ones or A, B, C, and G, you've got the, the chemicals that we represent with the letters A, T, G, and C. And uh, it turns out that <clears throat> the functional sequences of bases in a DNA molecule or the functional arrangements of amino acids in a protein are fantastically rare. Uh, and another illustration to get this across, if you've got a combination lock, uh, and you've got four four dials on it and ten digits. Uh, you've got ten thousand possibilities. But we could all agree that if you have a a thief who comes up, finds a, a a bike, and he knows he's got you know several days to work on this, he can he can by chance eventually find the combination. But using the same principles of probabilistic reasoning, you could also we could all also agree that if that same lock had ten dials on it with ten billion combinations, that in that same period of time, it would be much more, overwhelmingly more likely than not, that that random search method would, it would, would likely fail. Well, it turns out that the, the, the rarity of functional genes and functional proteins to the corresponding what's called sequence space of possible arrangements of the relevant uh, constituents is it is vastly more improbable than our 10 dial lock. It's for, there have been various modes of estimating this by protein scientists and, and uh, molecular biologists, but uh, one recent estimate had put that number at one in 10 to the 77th power for a relatively modest uh, uh, section of a protein called a protein fold. And so what happens is when you run the math, you're in the same situation as the thief who's only got, you know, a, a, a few hours to crack the, the ten dial lock. Even 
evolutionary deep time is not sufficient to search the, the possibilities. So it becomes, in the same way, vastly more likely than not that the mutation selection mechanism would not find mm. uh, this new gene or protein in the time available. And if, if the mechanism is more likely to fail, vastly, overwhelmingly more likely to fail, then the hypothesis that that's how it was done is also more likely to be false. And so that's the, the, the bottom line there is that the mutation selection mechanism is not an adequate mechanism for generating the information that's necessary to build, to, just to service the proteins, let yeah, alone yeah. the higher level stuff. And, and, and so th is your conclusion then on the basis of, of all of that, it doesn't appear that Darwinian se selection on random mutation and so on can account for Yeah, it, my conclusion is that the mutation selection mechanism is not an adequate uh, mechanism for generating the new digital or genetic information necessary to build the yep. proteins that are in turn necessary to serve as cell types and, and organisms. And, and in that um, sense, is is that then why you turn to intelligent design, to a designer, because... Well, no, I think there's a positive case for that. The other thing I just flag quickly is that that's only one of five arguments that I make in the book against the Darwinian <laughs> mechanism. It's got big problems. And, and the problems at the higher level of, of building the epigenetic information are probably even more severe. And, and they are the reasons that there are many uh, leading evolutionary theorists who mm. are saying mm. things like neo-Darwinism has no theory of the generative. It can't account uh, for these, these higher levels of information. Um, just just in, in 60 seconds then, outline yeah, but your But now you're trying to get case. me to the positive yeah, case. Yeah, the positive okay, case so, for intelligent design. Okay, the positive case is actually based on uh, two things. The evidence the, of, of the, the, the infusion of information required to build these animals in the history of life but also based on our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. There's a great principle of reasoning that da Darwin pioneered in The Origin of Species. And he said that when, when you're trying, it was called the vera causa principle. And he got it from Lyell and before that from Newton. Lyell's way of saying it was that, that we should be looking for causes now in operation. The present is the key to the past. What we see producing certain, if we want to explain an event in the remote past, uh, we should look for a cause that we know is capable of producing the effect in question. And uh, as I, be, I studied that uh, historical scientific methodology as, as a grad student in England, um, it, it hit me that this applied directly to the question of design or no design. Uh, the key thing that needs to be explained in the origin of living systems is the origin of the information that makes them possible. What do we know from our uniform and repeated experience that uh, is a sufficient cause to produce digital code or hierarchically organized forms of information as we find them in, in animal life or circuitry or control networks which we also find as crucial elements of animal life. All these features that make life so phenomenally interesting and complex uh, are also things that we know arise from one and only one type of cause in our experience of, of the cause and effect structure of the world, and that cause is intelligence. There's a famed information scientist, Henry Quassler, who was a pioneer in applying information science to molecular biology, and he said that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. And of course that's right. If we see digital code in a software program or a hieroglyphic inscription or information embedded in a radio signal or a headline in a newspaper, if we trace information back to its source, we always come to a mind not a material process. So by applying the same principles of, of reasoning that Darwin used in The Origin of Species, and in fact, in the book, I used the same method of reasoning he used, a method called the inference mm. of the best explanation, okay. where the best explanation is the one that invokes a cause known to produce the effect so, of the question. So, so you we argue can that, conclude, yeah. yeah, we can conclude that intelligent design is the best explanation the best for the, explanation. Inf the informational endowments that make complex life possible great okay well we we've we've heard the the, the broad case uh, sketched out there and we're going to obviously hear the other side of this argument now um as we bring in uh, charles marshall he's a professor of biology at uh, berkeley the university of california he's written um a, a scathing review of the book that we're talking about today darwin's doubt by stephen meyer um so we're going to also want your responses to today's program and let me just say that if you'd like to get in touch you can do that by emailing me unbelievable at press premier.org.uk plus of course you can get in touch via the social media uh, facebook twitter all the links available as ever from the unbelievable website where you can find this program uh, pass it on to friends subscribe to the podcast and everything else loads of interesting programs every week here on unbelievable that you'll want to listen to go to premier.org.uk slash unbelievable <laughs> Um,
Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. OK, time to hear the other side of today's argument. Uh, Charles Marshall joins me now on the line. Um, Charles, thank you for being with me today. Uh, you're, you're most welcome. Great to have you. Um, just very briefly, would you like to sketch out um, your background and, and um, uh, how you um, sort of have come to the position you hold at uh, Barclay? Uh, you mean in a professional sense or an intellectual sense? Well, uh, <laughs> are they mutually exclusive? Um, I, I, yes, both, if you would. Um, so so my, myself, I think, um, somewhat like Stephen, actually, um, I've been fascinated by um, how the universe unfolds, the way it structures. It's, it's captured my imagination as a, as a young child. Um, my training, in fact, following that was um, in physics, mathematics, physical chemistry, modern history, zoology, and paleontology. I felt that it was important to have a fairly you know, comprehensive grasp of the sciences and the humanities if we are, in fact, going to understand very hard and very interesting problems. Mm. Um, so my bachelor's degree was in physics and mathematics, and then I always paleontology, and then I felt that molecular biology was going to be key to understanding, something that Darwin knew nothing of in his day, and that we really need to understand and inject our knowledge of molecular biology and developmental biology into our evolutionary understanding if we're going to understand in more detail how life unfolded in space and in time. Mm. Um, and so I engaged in both molecular work, uh, both as a grad student and then as a postdoc. Um, and then I worked my way through jobs to my current position here at the University of California, Berkeley. Sure. Well, let's talk about the review, um, because you, you reviewed for Science Magazine, um, Darwin's Doubt. It appears to me that you object to both the way the science is represented and to the overall project of the intelligent design movement. Yeah, so let's start, let's start I think, where, where Stephen started with uh, the Cambrian explosion itself. And so um, you know, I'm going to jump somewhere slightly different to start off with. In, in, in Newton's day, one of the greats buried next to, to Darwin in Westminster Abbey, um, we did not know about radioactivity, fusion, fission. And so it was difficult to understand where the energy of the sun came from. And so it would be easy at that point to say, look, we have no known mechanism at this point in time to explain the origin of the sun's energy. It would be exacerbated much worse if he actually knew how old the universe was. <laughs> and one could then stop at that point and say, well, there's some sort of external agency to the universe that's feeding it, that there's no other option. Now, if you, if you trust the process of science, trust the, our ability through persistent commitment, then... Eventually, we discover things that now make the apparently in nonsensible sensible. I take you back to Plato, of course, where mm. the sensible is the world of cause and effect. And so I've been interested in the question of whether or not we're fundamentally missing something in the Cayman explosion. It uh, happened a long time ago, half a billion years. The evidence is a little thin because it's half a billion years old. We don't have living organisms from that particular point in time. And so I've always been keen to read people who come from outside of the scientific tradition because sometimes when people have alternative commitments, sometimes they hit upon weaknesses in the thinking internally because we get blind to things that we're just used to seeing every day. Mm. So I, I've been following the sort of the creationist in its previous incarnations, uh, now intelligent design um, literature, in the hopes that maybe they point to something that's just fundamentally like, wow, we really can't solve that problem, and we've been blind to it because we just get used to the way we think about things. So I was very interested in reading, in, in reading Stephen's book for that, for that matter. Um, so I read it. I enjoyed it. He writes very well. He's worked very, very hard. Um, but as I got through the book, I found myself struck by the fact that the model that he espouses for the Cambrian explosion is kind of a 1980s model of the way genes operate. Um, now, if we'd been in 1980s, which is where I was as a beginning graduate student, I would have said, there's an interesting problem. I need to work on that. In fact, I did do that with my born-again Christian undergraduate mentor in Australia, <laughs> asking the question, well, can we explain the Cayman explosion of animals um, with our current understanding of the way development operates. Um, so we've made an enormous pro uh, progress 
since those 1980s. Um, and the, the key thing that was, in my opinion, missed in Stephen's book, I mean, he discusses it but dismisses it, is that when I was a lad, <laughs> the 70s and 80s, we were fundamentally taught that the new body plans had to be built with new genes. Mm -hmm. Helicopters built with one set of components, a computer's built with a different set of components. And so every new animal body plan had to be built with a completely different set of genes. And it seemed rather spectacular and amazing that all of those genes would be invented simultaneously across many, many lineages simultaneously. So that's sort of the invention of genetic information sort of argument. Through a whole series of revolutions, many of them winning Nobel Prizes, many of them having very, very deep implications for the health sciences, for understanding of our own biology, it becomes apparent that the number of genes required to make animals is modest in the order of 10,000. The genes that are critical to morphology, just 1,000 or so, for hardly any of them. And then staggeringly, staggeringly, that the animals all use essentially the same genes, just deployed slightly differently. We have the same genes that set the developmental programs for making eyes. We share the same genes for making our front ends from our back ends, our upside from our downside. And all of a sudden you go, wow, there isn't anything like the need for massive genic evolution to understand the Cambrian explosion as one might have envisioned mm -hmm. in the 1970s, 80s, and, and well before that in, in Darwin's day. And so I felt a little frustrated because I actually discussed this in a review that I wrote in 2006, summarizing and integrating some of this information. And, and you know, Stephen's, the first third of his book, um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed reading it, and it's, it's good scholarship, and it looks like good science. Well, it's a description, it's not really science, a description of the science. And then I found that I outlined this, these arguments, and it's completely missed in the book. The whole emphasis of the book is centered around the origins of brand new genes to explain the Cambrian explosion. And yet the papers that I'd written and people like Jim Valentine and Sean Carroll and Eric Davidson and Doug Owen suggested, in fact, that isn't what we currently believe is required for the Cambrian explosion. So I'm not sure scathing is the right word. I mean, if you view it as scathing, well, then fair enough. But just speaking as a, someone committed to understanding the Cambrian explosion... I found myself disappointed that the arguments that were made in the papers that he cited weren't the ones that he confronted directly. He confronted a, a different set of problems that I think hark back to an older mm -hmm. age. And I attributed it, and it's always dangerous to attribute to pe things to people you don't know, to the fact that he's, he's not a biologist, he's a philosopher, um, and it's very, very hard to keep up with the the... the, the fire hydrant of new conceptual okay. data that's coming in. We're, we're going to have to take a quick break, uh, and we've heard both sides sketched out to some degree. I'll, I will let you come back just briefly as well, um, because I want to ask you about your, your general concern that, that you outline in that review there, Charles, that this is essentially sophisticated God of the gaps approach um, is, is what uh, it boils down to. Um, but we'll, we'll do that in a moment's time. And of course, Stephen will respond. Uh, we're talking about intelligent design on the program, not something uh, we've covered in a little while, but um, certainly has come back into the headlines with the release of Darwin's Doubt earlier this year by Stephen Meyer. Um, it's all about the origins of animal life um, in the Cambrian explosion, as it's sometimes called, and whether it lends evidence to the case for intelligent design over evolution. Uh, and I'm joined by the author, Stephen Meyer, um, on the line from um, uh, Seattle today. Uh, Charles Marshall is in California, and uh, he's a biology professor at Berkeley University there. And uh, he's talking about his views on this uh, whole area and his response to Stephen Meyer. So come back in a moment's time for more here on the program that aims to get you thinking unbelievable you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio welcome back to unbelievable it's saturday afternoon uh, we're doing a scientific discussion today in the area of intelligent design uh, is evolution the full story 
of how animal life and all its variety came to exist in the world today. Well, uh, Stephen Meyer has written a controversial new book, Darwin's Doubt, in which he claims that the explosion of many forms of life in the Cambrian explosion uh, some 530 million years ago uh, can best be attributed to the agency of intelligence. Uh, we simply can't understand and uh, account for the variety of animal life that suddenly appeared on the scene um, by a normal sort of neo-Darwinian processes of evolution and so uh, that's all outlined in great detail in his new book darwin's doubt Uh, charles marshall is professor of biology at the university of california berkeley and he's written a review of the book in which he uh, questions much of the science that uh, stephen meyer has uh, brought into the picture and indeed the intelligent design movement overall and of course as ever i'm looking for your responses today so if you'd like to get in touch then do contact me unbelievable at premier.org.uk We've also got the Twitter and Facebook accounts operational if you want to do it that way. At Unbelievable JB, my Twitter handle, facebook.com slash Unbelievable JB if you want to get in touch that way. All those links and more available, of course, from the website premier.org.uk slash Unbelievable, where you can find today's show and many others indeed. And we are going to be reading uh, towards um, the end of our discussion some of your questions that you sent in via Twitter and Facebook as well. See what my guests Charles Marshall and Steve Meyer have to say about those. I promised to allow just a little bit more time for you, Charles, um, just as you sort of conclude your opening remarks, as it were, because um, as well as obviously critiquing whether Steve has dealt with the current science properly, your, your overall concern is that essentially he's picking holes in evolutionary theory um, and then inserting God into those gaps. So, so just speak on that, if you would, just for a moment. Yeah, so first of all, um, I'm, I'm going to correct your wording slightly. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Is, um, I, and I, I, mis, I miswrote my, my article. What I should have said is, uh, is um, intelligent designer of the gaps, okay. as, as Stephen has, <laughs> has pointed out. Um, it's an argument for God. It's an argument for an intelligent designer. And so I think what's really interesting to me is the, the analogy that whenever there is sort of rich information content, that there is a mind behind it is very interesting But Stephen said something very interesting in his opening remarks there, which is when you trace back through all the processes that have produced the radio waves or the computers, you can find the presence of a mind. When you can trace back through all of the material processes that have generated the computer or the radio signal, you can find the presence of a mind. Mm. So what's critical here is that when we build our objects that are intelligently designed or not so intelligently designed, there's an incredible infrastructure associated with those objects. You don't have this tiny little piece of matter somewhere that grows and proliferates and turns into a computer. You have an enormous number of factories and people and mines and railways and cars and aircraft and communications coordinating the arrival of all these component parts that are then assembled into the computer or the radio station. So to me, the fundamental analogy between a human-built object and life is just completely off base. What is remarkable about about life and awes me and clearly awes Stephen, awes all of us, is that you start off with a, a single cell and then it builds from the bottom up, not the top down, assembling little components, nucleotides and amino acids, and assembles this remarkable structure. One of the key differences, there are two key differences between intelligently designed human objects and life. The first one is that um, life actually grows, where our objects do not. Life constantly rebuilds itself. Um, Human-made objects do not. And the second thing that's incredible is that when you take a human-made object, the pieces are not interchangeable. So if I take the famous blind watchmaker and you take a watch, you can't move the objects around within it. So if indeed we were built like watches, I would have to agree that evolution would be completely and utterly impossible. But the amazing thing about life is that there are all these components that are interchangeable. We're built internally utterly differently from the way that the external macroscopic physical world is built. That is strings of nucleotides, strings of amino acids. And those strings are not like the strings of computer code or language. I can leave out a word not or change the word intelligent designer for God. 
the actual precise string in written language and code makes an incredible difference to the meaning of it. You can't tweak anything much without ruining it. But what's spectacular about proteins is that it needs to fold up so that the active site, relatively few amino acids, can contact, say, the DNA appropriately so that gene can be switched on. All that matters is that it folds with an inside and an outside, that it doesn't bump into anything else that it's not supposed to, and that it can get into the DNA. So the specificity of information in a protein is hundreds of orders of magnitudes less than the degree of specificity for a computer code or for a written text. Okay. And, and so let me, let me finish, mm. and it comes down to primary commitment. Primary commitment. The primary commitment of the... Um, what's it called, the Discovery Institute, IDDI, I'm a little bit dyslexic, mm -hmm. of the Discovery Institute, is to actually undo the moral discord that they feel that scientific materialism has introduced into our culture. The vehicle by which they're going to achieve that goal is to try to get theistic belief established into the sciences. So I posit that they're not actually all that interested in the Cambrian explosion. What they're interested in is inserting a theistic view of science so that they can address the issue that they're really concerned with, and they should be, it's important, and that's sort of how do we live in a moral world, in a socially rich world. Okay. Well, you've, you've outlined a great deal there, and I'm sure Stephen would like to respond. So I'm, I'm going to give you a chance um, to, to just address some of those issues. Where do you want to start, Stephen? Um, well, do, I, do you want to yeah. start with the, the, the issue that Charles raises let's go, initially? Let, let's go back. Yeah, let's go back to the science first. But I, I'd yeah. actually first like to also uh, uh, correct the scathing thing. I, <laughs> I appreciated Charles's review. Okay. It was the, fir it was the first uh, critical review of the book that attempted to address the main argument of the book. And the main argument of the book, again, is that the, the necessary information, both the genetic and, and higher levels, the epigenetic information necessary to build Cambrian animals, is the result of an intelligent designer. Um, I, I think his characterization of the science, though, is a bit unfair. Uh, the, the 13th chapter of the book looks at not only the, the necessary genes, but it looks at the higher level control systems called developmental gene regulatory networks that are involved in organizing the gene products and choreographing the expression of gene products uh, in, a, in a very much in a circuit-like manner. And this is this is where I, I actually in, just I, I think it's just wonderful to be able to have this conversation. I've read i read Charles's papers for years, and he made a very provocative and interesting proposal in his review in Science as a way of rebutting the inf the, the central information argument of the book. And his proposal was this: that these developmental gene regulatory networks uh, could have been rewired by the evolutionary process in the way they acted on pre-existing genes to produce new body plans. Now, uh, there, are, there are a number of things, and I think that's the central. He, he was, he, you know, I, I really reject the idea that the, the book has a 1980s view I was going to say, uh, what, what, what do you make um, of that? Do you well, believe you well, are actually I, interacting with the most current I, science here? Ab absolutely not, because uh, I, I look at uh, the role of developmental body plan mutations. I look at the role of these developmental gene regulatory networks. I look at the need for higher levels of epigenetic information in the book, and I engage the main post-neo-Darwinian models that have been, been, been developed. I, I, having said that, I love the proposal he made because it's direct and it's specific and it's right on point. So let me, let, let me address that because okay. I think it's very important in advancing a really constructive conversation. Here. And if you can try and keep the science at a level where hopefully we can all more or gotcha. less understand okay. what yeah, you yeah. uh, Do my best. Um, so so it, what Professor Marshall proposes is that there was this pre-adapted genome, maybe as far back as the pre-Cambrian, that had these, these genes that tell other genes what to do, the regulatory genes. And then he acknowledges that there was also, in addition, a need for gene novelties, which is to say new genes that make the, the, the basic distinctive parts of the new animals. Now, that, that second acknowledgment is itself a concession that there was a lot, a lot of new genetic information needed. You can't get away from the need for genes. And he, he mentioned that most animals have around 10,000. We now know that about 10% 
of the of the genomes of individual animals are made up of what are called uh, taxonomically restricted genes. These are genes that are unique to those animals. So there's a lot of new genetic information that has to arise even on his proposal. But secondly, notice that he presupposes a pre-adapted genome back in the presumably the Precambrian. So the rest of that genetic information, he hasn't explained the rest of that genetic information either. He said he's, he's just, in a sense, helped himself to it and presupposed its existence. But beyond that, the proposal that you could rewire these, these higher-level control systems, these developmental gene regulatory networks that control how the gene products uh, differentiate themselves from each other and how cell types differentiate themselves from each other and, and, and tissues and organs up to building body plans, I think itself conceals an informational requirement. Rewiring is a, is a teleological metaphor. Engineers re rewire things, but letting that pass. Anytime you specify one material condition and, and, uh, and exclude another, you're imparting a bit of information. Rewiring would require a, a, a lot of informational inputs. Um, in particular, specifically in biology, there are these sections next to genes uh, called cis regulatory elements that are involved in, in these circuits. They would need to be mutated in, coordinate, in a coordinated way to actually rewire a circuit. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do, and we know that because the actual data we have from the experiment, and he mentioned that I, I, I directly addressed the work of Eric Davidson, who has shown that the, 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 the central subcircuits of these developmental gene regu regulatory networks cannot be perturbed without catastrophic effects to a developing organism. And yet, to change one animal body plan into another, you would need to change these, cent the, these central subcircuits of these, these systems. One final point on, on, mm. on just his proposal. Well, his proposal was that maybe these developmental gene regulatory networks could have been more malleable in the past. But these developmental gene regulatory networks are like circuits. They are certainly control systems. And what control systems do is that they specify outcomes in space and time. And biological control systems are exquisitely constrained to specify outcomes in a way that actually gets you a unique animal body plan. So the idea that you could have a control system that isn't, that, that's loosey-goosey, that isn't specifying outcomes, I think, I think is incoherent. Any control system that doesn't specify outcomes isn't really a control system. It's not a, I don't, I, I can't understand what a developmental gene regulatory network would have been doing if it was not constraining the timing and the expression of networks of genes. So, so he, I, I think his, his commitment to a materialistic explanation has led him to reject a really basic tenet of historical scientific reasoning, which is that we should let our knowledge of cause and effect in the present determine our understanding of what happened in the past. What we know from the present is you can't perturb these developmental gene regulatory networks or else you shut down development and evolution terminates. But instead of respecting what we've learned from experimental data, he proposes something that's incoherent on, uh, on, on basic engineering theoretic terms and which is completely okay. contrary to well, the, the empirical data that we have. I, okay, well, we'll get maybe to some of those other issues around um, the, the general project of intelligent design and, and, and whether there is this, the, you know... Yeah, it won't surprise wedge, you. I have, a, uh, I have a different take on whether this is <laughs> yeah. a god of the gaps. Argument. Yeah. Of course. Um, but let, let's keep it then on this um, rather more scientific aspect of the uh, developmentary gene regulatory networks. And I'm learning lots of new te techniques terms as we go along here. Um, Charles, okay, you've heard um, Stephen's response there. What do you say? Um, have, have you assumed too much? Are you trying to buy information when it's um, not available to you and so on? Well, as, as you might imagine, I think my answer is I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, Stephen's getting a little exasperated and I think that's uh, partly a consequence of the fact that we, we are coming at this from very different angles. Um, so let me try to answer that question. Um, one of the things that I think is difficult to comprehend is that from an evolutionary standpoint, life unfolds. And as it unfolds, it starts to accrete complexity and sophistication. And so the argument that I made in my, I had science, actually science didn't invite me to write the review, I offered to write the review. Um, and they offered me 800 words and only 800 words, so I had to be <laughs> as succinct as I could. But um, the argument I made, and Eric Davidson made, is that those gene, some of those gene regulatory networks were less encumbered at the beginning. So let me just 
deal with it. Let me see if I can attack this problem with something that Stephen said, which is he can't see how you can take a gene regulatory network from one body plan and change it into the gene regulatory network of another body plan because those networks now are committed to being a fly or a sea urchin or a jellyfish. And I couldn't agree more. He's precisely correct. But now we get to the unfolding issue. If we wind back the evolutionary clock far enough, we have just single-celled organisms. And then after a while, we start to get small colonial organisms. And then after a while, they get large enough that they start to look like the first animals. And those first animals that are alive and well today are called sponges. And what is remarkable about sponges is that they do not have tissues. They do not have organs. They have essentially the same set of genes as a Drosophila and a jellyfish and a human, but they do not have tissues. They do not have organs. And so you have then the genes that have the capacity to make tissues and organs already sitting there. And so what we think happened in the Cambrian explosion is we had different lineages independently acquiring different body plans. Once those body plans are in place, then selection holds them in place, and then future genes are added to them, making that impossible. So it's like having 10 completely different types of building, and initially you start off with just the foundation on the, on the, on the ground, and those foundations can look very, very different. I'm building very, very different types of building. But once I build the rest of the building on top of it, whether it's a skyscraper, an aircraft, uh, an airport terminal, a school, a house, then I can't be messing with the foundation anymore after that. Mm. So that's the sort of the analogy for the idea that those foundations are, so one thing is that they've been later encumbered, and the second one is that they all evolved from something that was not yet a complex body, and, uh, body plan. So does, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, but but isn't it, uh, I mean, perhaps, Stephen, you want to just comment on it. Isn't this the point then that, that you don't believe that can have happened in the short time scale we're talking about with the Cambrian explosion? Well, I, I think that uh, sometimes the metaphorical language conceals really difficult, um, essentially, bioengineering problems. I completely agree with Charles that once you have the body plans, that natural selection does hold them in place. I think that's a perfectly legitimate explanation for what's often called stasis. Um, but I, I, I watched one of his um, uh, lectures on, online. It's a very good lecture and uh, made me all the more excited to have the conversation. But um, it was about the, this idea that life is, has this capacity to unfold, whereas watches or, or, or uh, humanly designed things don't. But I was struck by the, the number of cases in which uh, Professor Marshall cited these various capacities for self-organization or unfolding, but in each case he acknowledged that they had that capacity because of, uh, because of prior genetic information. Sometimes he would refer to that information metaphorically as a few simple rules, but, but uh, so I see that there are you know the the and in my, in my book I look specifically at the self organizational theorists uh, Stuart Kaufman Stuart Newman they they propose something very much like this with uh, something they call developmental patterning modules and 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 they I think very expertly show that there are there is a kind of inherent capacity for organisms to develop complexity and and forms of organization but the key thing is that always that complexity depends upon prior informational complexity yeah prior information let, let, let's allow charles so in i, I think so, that even even in the in the explanation that charles has just given there he's still helping himself to the informational okay. endowments that make those okay so so, possible. so so i i so I, I if i can so i think that's a very good point and so what i'd like to note there's a subtle shift in grounds and i'm not trying to deny the point that stephen just made is that in his book in his book which i read um the emphasis was on the creation of the new genetic information, and he placed that at the time of the Cambrian explosion. And so in my science review, what I did is I responded to that specific claim. Now, what Stephen seems to be saying now, that he is okay with the idea that, in fact, that genetic information may have had its origins um, elsewhere. And so, so fair enough. So then you have to address the question, where does that genetic information actually have to come from in the first instance? 
And I think that's a very important and critical point. And so it's less to do now with the Cambrian explosion per se. It's less to do with Darwin's doubt and the sudden emergence of fossils at the base of the Cambrian. It's more to do now with where does the genetic information and the epigenetic information come from that makes animals, organisms, plants. And so I think that's a very, very important point. Mm. That was a clarifying thing about your review too, Charles, because um, I think it is certainly the case, as you acknowledge, that there is a need for gene novelty at, at, the, at the point of, of the, the Cambrian. Uh, but it could well, your proposal is also, it, it could well be that the genetic requirements were parceled out in, in, in phases. And, um, but either way, I think you've got to account for that, that information. And, the, and where, where I objected to your, your earlier characterization is that I, I, am, I am myself not a, a, a gene centrist. I'm not a DNA centrist. I, I, I think that DNA is necessary but not sufficient. The information in DNA is necessary, but not sufficient to build animals. I think you need these higher levels. I, I absolutely affirm your uh, interest in developmental gene regulatory networks. I've read your papers. I love them. And the, and the epigenetic uh, revolution, I think, is just an absolutely fascinating thing. I think what, what, when we think about life, we, I think we have to now reckon on a kind of hierarchically organized information uh, information processing system and, and information expressing system that is, uh, it, it's just, uh, it's a fantastic thing to, to begin t to really think about in its full complexity. Yeah, so, I've got one response to that, which is, you betcha. Yeah, right, <laughs> Precisely. Right. And, so, and so I think, you know, as, as a graduate student, one of my, um, so half my PhD was molecular biology and half of it was paleontology, and my molecular biology mentors made the argument over and over again that the organizing principle for life is actually the cell and it's the cytoplasm that sort of controls the way in which the DNA is manipulated, expressed, packaged, unpackaged, replicated. And of course then cells make organs and tissues and organisms. So the central organizing principle of life is in fact at the level of the cell, it isn't at the level of the DNA and that's just a common misunderstanding in popular yeah. biology because DNA is easy to understand. So then coming to this issue of, of, of sort of genic evolution, where does the information come from? So energy flows onto the Earth's surface at an unbelievably steady and continuous rate. And the second law of thermodynamics actually tells us that in energy flow situations, that there's increased order and material cycles. So one way of expressing the second law of thermodynamics is to say that driven systems like the surface of the Earth, explore the improbable. And then when you have the notion of chemical bonds where there are lots of interchangeable elements, amino acids, nucleotides, carbon atoms, that can string out making longer and longer and longer and longer strings, so you start to explore the properties of those strings. And some of them become functional proteins and a lot of them turn out to be nothing interesting. So the fact that complexity emerges on a planet like ourselves is I think, entirely understandable in terms of simple mechanical processes. I say I'm a materialist, but I would also say that to me, matter is unbelievable. It's capable of sentience. <laughs> it is capable of consciousness. It is capable of compassion, morality. So some of the characterizations that I've seen in my review from the Discovery Institute sort of paint me as a, a materialist who thinks there's none of these things. So that's a different debate. So now let's get to this issue of Axe. I don't know how to pronounce well, it, well, Stephen. What's his can, last can name? How do I pronounce it? Let, let's allow Steve point. just to jump in quickly, and, yeah, and then we're uh, going to go to a break in about two minutes. So, so yeah, quick I, I response. I think this, this second law thing is really important. Uh, there is a branch of thermodynamics called non-equilibrium thermodynamics that looks at what happens when you pump energy through a system. I wrote about it extensively in my first book because it's, it was a popular proposal for explaining the origin of the information necessary to build the first living cell and the origin of life debate. People like Prigogine are, are important figures. But I, th I think most origin of life researchers have rejected that idea that you can get information from the um, from the order through a system because all of the examples of energy flowing through a system producing order are producing symmetric, redundant order, simple patterns, spiral wave currents, convection currents, that sort of thing. The kind of order you get when you've, you, you, know, you, you uh, drain the bathtub and, and, and you get a swirl. 
Um, the kind of order we have in biology is not really it shouldn't be called order in thermodynamic terms. It's 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 called complexity, or better term is specified complexity or functional information. Information and order. There's a conf, there's a conflation of two concepts there. Energy. I used to have an illustration to get this across to students. I had this big. Uh, 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 two plastic Coke bottles that had been put together uh, with a, a little fastening device, and inside was blue liquid with, with uh, nice little sparkles. And if you put energy into that closed system by, by moving it in a circular motion, it would create a nice, beautiful vortex, order. But those little sparkles didn't spell anything. You don't get in, information or order aren't the same thing. So I don't, I don't think that's a, a legitimate explanation for the origin of information. We, I go into that in a great deal of detail in Signature in the Cell. We're going to have to um, just take another quick break. Um, when we come back, uh, despite the fact that I'm sure there's much more we could d speak of in the terms of the science and so on, um, I would like to go to some of the questions we've had in as well to both of you uh, in, in equal measure um, from our Twitter and Facebook users. So uh, we're listening uh, to two experts in their field discuss the case for intelligent design and evolution and the Cambrian explosion. It's all to do with Darwin's Doubt, the new book by Stephen Meyer, a leading intelligent design theorist with the Discovery Institute. Charles Marshall is his critic. Perhaps it's not a scathing review, um, and uh, perhaps I shouldn't have called it that at the outset of the programme, but he's certainly written a review questioning um, the way Steve has handled the science in terms of um, this whole area, and indeed questioning the, the motives of uh, organisations like the uh, Discovery Institute. So come back in a moment's time as we continue this fascinating discussion on the science of the uh, Cambrian explosion. Where did all those new animals come from? Was it the result of intelligent design or can we explain it in evolutionary terms? Uh, we'll be back in a moment's time. Welcome back to the final part of Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. Uh, don't forget that straight after today's programme between four and five here on Premier Radio, you can hear my interview with Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement. What an interesting guy. What a lot of stories he has to tell, not just about the good things, but also some of the difficulties he's had, struggles with prayer as well. Well worth tuning in for that between four and five. If you're coming back at the same time next week for Unbelievable, a very exciting lineup of guests joining me for a programme looking at the morality and history of the Old Testament. This is in relation to the new Bible TV series that begins airing tonight here in the UK on Channel 5. And that's going to be airing throughout December. It's a 10-part uh, mini-series. And so we're going to be looking at that uh, in the first of a couple of programmes looking at this new Bible TV series starting next week. I can't divulge exactly who's going to be on the programme at this point. It's still sort of slightly being worked out, but some very exciting potential guests. So let me assure you, you won't want to miss next week's programme. All right, got that? Don't miss next week's programme. Uh, right now, time to get into the final part of today's show. Uh, just a reminder, no time for feedback at the end of today's show, giving it all over to this discussion that we've been having today. But we are going to be hearing some of your questions that were put to my guests on today's programme. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. So the third and final part of this discussion on intelligent design, the new book by Stephen C. Meyer is Darwin's Doubt, all about the explosion of animal life in the Cambrian era about 530 million years ago and whether it can be explained by naturalistic Darwinian processes or whether we do actually need to turn to intelligent design and intelligent agency to explain all these new novel forms of life and all the genetics that would have gone into creating them and, and bringing them about. Well, we've already heard um, in the first two parts uh, a, a lengthy discussion between Charles Marshall, who's Professor of Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and has written a review of the book. Um, Stephen Meyer is also on the line from Seattle. And so we're, we're talking about this, gentlemen, and I wanted to bring in some of the comments that have come in from listeners on Facebook and Twitter. Um, for instance, um, it's put very simply by someone who calls himself God free world on uh, Twitter. Uh, it says ID isn't a theory. It's religious propaganda. Um, and elsewhere, um, there are others who are asking about the um, the nature of the religious enterprise of intelligent design. Um, talk to me about this, Charles. Your, your concern is that we are um, dealing with something which ultimately is more about these uh, overarching concerns about God and the place of God in science and um, whether materialism is kind of coming to dominate our worldview. Uh, 
are you personally anxious about religion or what what kind of view do you take you're, you're not a believer yourself obviously are you it, it really depends on what you mean by a believer so one of the great sprinters of all time eric liddell you know the sorry the scottish sprinter was um, a missionary who went off to China. Mm. And at one point, his, his sister sort of says to him, she's very concerned that the material world is, is enticing him away from God. And, and Eric says to her, God made me fast. <laughs> and when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And so for me, I believe, I mean, er, uh, Stephen's characterization of, of me is correct that we can understand things like the Cambrian explosion, the emergence of new morphologies, through making maps, that's what science is about, making maps that are explicitly sort of spatial and temporal. We can sort of write down and understand what happened in space and time. And I find for myself when I'm in that pursuit of knowing in that way when I'm speaking to someone who is religious and I don't attend formal church, I'm not formally religious, if I was speaking to someone like Eric Liddell's sister, I would say, I feel God's pleasure. <laughs> now, I'm not religious, I don't attend church, but I think that same sense of spirituality, that sense of awe of the amazing universe that we live on, is exactly the same amongst many of our scientists as it is for... I would imagine all Christians, Hindus, etc. So the notion of spirituality, which is clearly a human capacity, that I share with, with, with I suspect, almost everybody else. Mm. Well, let, let's actually allow, because you did sort of spell it out earlier, let's allow Steve to respond. Well, and to your friendly call, or your friendly Twitter mate as well. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the idea that those of us who are working on intelligent design are motivated by this big cultural project and um, attempt to impose theocracy or religious propaganda is, re is really an unfair characterization. Um, I, I uh, have been working on intelligent design, the ideas around this, back since the late 80s in grad school. I started thinking about it when I was a PhD student in the philosophy of science at Cambridge. Prior to that, I worked as a, a geophysicist. Uh, I direct a, a program of research at the Discovery Institute with uh, biologists in many sub-disciplines. We have a, an independent lab that we've helped to start. And um, uh, D Discovery, when we were invited to, to join, was a pre-existing political think tank that did have an ideological orientation. It was concerned about the role of materialism in society. Uh, but uh, people can have lots of different interests and motives. I am fascinated by the science. I always have been. I, one, of the things, one of the reasons I'm excited about, about the, the opportunity to have this conversation with Charles is that he and I are clearly uh, have a passion for the same subject. Obviously, we have different, a different point of view about it. But um, so, and, and I think it's really important, just a basic logical point, uh, it, you, you can't critique an argument by pointing to the motive of the person arguing. That's the, the old genetic fallacy. And lots of people have lots of different motives, mixed, religious, anti-religious, no religious at all. But one of, one of the motives I know of the scientists that I work with is we want to know what really happened to cause life to come into existence. Let, let's That's do, a basic let, scientific question. Let me ask you. And, uh, could, could I just make on. one <laughs> final point on this? Is, there's a real important distinction between the implications of the theory of intelligent design and the foundation. And what I show in the book is that intelligent design is based on scientific evidence, and it's based on an application of the standard method of scientific reasoning that Darwin himself pioneered, the historical scientific method. So for both those reasons, it should be regarded as a scientific theory. That it may have larger uh, implications for philosophical, worldview, metaphysical questions, we don't deny. But there is a clear distinction between the basis of the theory and the implications. And, and uh, I'm not reasoning from a prior theological premise. That's the whole point of intelligent design. That's what I was on a different British radio program yesterday, and someone finally threw, <laughs> sent a question in, does he believe in creation or not in plain <laughs> English? You know, they were frustrated because I was clearly not basing the, the argument on a scriptural well, foundation. Let, let's, let, 
I mean, coming back to you, Charles, at the end of your review, you write this, Mayer's book ends with a heartwarming story of his normally fearless son losing his orientation on the impressive scree slopes that cradle the Burgess Shale, the iconic symbol of the Cambrian explosion, and his need to look back to his father for security. I was puzzled. Why the parable in a book ostensibly about philosophy and science? Then I realised that the book's subtext is to provide solace to those who feel their faith undermined by secular society and by science in particular. So you do feel there is a, a, a bottom, a sort of religious sort of motivation to what uh, Stephen is doing, despite his protestations that it's it's really the science he's interested in. Um, I think the answer to that is yes, I do feel it's there. Um, you know, as, as, as Mark Twain said, there's always three truths. There's the <laughs> truth you tell others, there's the truth you tell yourself, and then there's the real truth. <laughs> Um, and so, so that was, you know, that, I think that statement, I, I hold by that statement. Um, and my concern is, and this is my concern from a scientific standpoint, is that we often run into situations in science where, where we, where the makers of maps, maps are an object that we can then pass on to somebody else. And when you make a map, you often run into situations where you, you've got a conundrum. I don't understand how this operates or the way that operates. And so my, my apprehension with, with the intelligent design movement is there's sort of a leap in saying, well, we've, we've, we've got that sorted for you already. It's an intelligent designer. The, you know, some intelligent designer just did it. And that doesn't provide any help at all in terms of making a map into the unknown that helps us actually understand the universe that we live in. And in that sense, because it actually hasn't pos- contributed anything positive yet, you know, the English language consists of about a million words. Half a million of those have come from the process of science as we make maps into the unknown. Intelligent design hasn't offered any new words yet. There isn't anything established concrete that you can point to. Mm. And so, so, you know, in principle, it might plausibly in some people's mind be viewed as a scientific theory, but pony up, offer us something help contribute to the map of the way it operates in a tangible, okay. explicit way. Science is about making tangible, explicit contributions. Do you want to come back on that, Stephen? Yeah, that, I, I, I welcome the challenge, actually. But let me first say about the, the two truths, I'll, or three truths, let me give two. I, I'm quite willing to say that I am uh, motivated by the scientific question, and I'm also interested in the deep intersection of the, the scientific questions with the philosophical questions. Uh, if intelligent design has broadly theistic implications, so be it. I think that's fascinating. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the founders of modern science were motivated by theistic belief. I, you can't refute a theory by pointing to the motivations. And I would say mine are mixed. I have, both, I have both philosophical motivations and scientific motivations and theological motivations. There are staunch Darwinists who want to say that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. I think you have one in your country, Justin. So <laughs> Um, yes, I've, so I think I've heard I, of it. I think we need to just set this, the question of motives aside. It's not germane to the, the truth of the proposition under debate. As to the map question, I completely agree. One of the things we want from scientific theories is we, that we want them to explain the facts that we already have. We want them to have a, a, a wide explanatory power. And I made the case for intelligent design based on its wide explanatory power. We also like our scientific theories to have implications for other research questions. We want them to have heuristic value. We want them to make predictions. And in the, in the end of Signature in the Cell, I laid out uh, 10 predictions that are made by the theory of intelligent design. And what, one of the predictions that we were making back in the 90s that the, the neo-Darwinists in specifically were, <laughs> were not, they were making the opposite prediction, was that the non-functional regions of the genome, which they quickly dubbed to be junk because they thought the non-protein coding regions of the genome were the detritus of the, the, the leftovers of the, of the random trial and error process of mutation and selection. Uh, we predicted that those sections of the genome would be shown to be importantly functional. We acknowledge that mutations are a real process, but we didn't think that that if the genome had been designed intelligently, that the signal should be dwarfed by the noise, that the mutations, mm. uh, the, the, the junk. And it's been a spectacular finding of the last uh, decade, and especially the, the last fall with the publication of the ENCODE project, that that prediction has borne out. And, and we think that if you view life as a design system, 
rather than one that arose gradually through incremental variation, etc. There are going to be some things that are that, where there's no difference in what you would what, what you would expect to see, but there will be other things that are different. In other words, you can make discriminating predictions on the basis of intelligent design, and that's what the lab Biologic is pursuing. There are many scientists around the world who are working on intelligent design. We have a, a growing network, and so I welcome Charles's mm. challenge, and I think it's a it's a valid and legitimate challenge, and we that's that's the that's where that's where we intend to go. Okay, well, let, let, uh, quick response, Charles, and then I do want to bring another question in. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just saying. I mean, that's where they intend to go. So. We'll, go there and then we'll talk again in well, terms of this issue of of whether it's a science let, not yeah, there yeah, yet check, check out the journal biocomplexity there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's uh, okay. already being done I, in I, the I, I have and it doesn't hold up in my scientific opinion well i yet. disagree with you yeah, that's just <laughs> yeah, an i know i know <laughs> well uh, look, look here's another question for you again steve um um, what about um, the issue of the actual designer? I mean, Jerry Adams asks, could you explain what you think the nature of the intelligent designer is? Considering the only intelligence we know of is animal intelligence, does this mean he believes the designer to be an animal of some description? If not, what does Steve imagine the source of the intelligence to be? Someone wanting to press you a bit further on the nature of the design that you keep talking about. Who is the designer and do you have evidence for that? Yeah, I think we know of, uh, let's go back to the quote by Henry Kostler. He said that uh, information is habitually associate, associated with conscious activity. Uh, what we know as human agents is that we have, a, we have consciousness. And we, as human agents, we also have rationality. And we know a lot about the reality of what it is to have a mind because we have them. We know that perhaps better than anything else we know uh, indirectly by um, e even by science because all of our scientific knowledge is mediated through the senses. As much of it is inferentially based. So we know we have minds. We also know from our experience uh, something of what minds can do. And one of the things that minds can do is they can, they can generate information. They can generate code. They can generate alphabetic sequences that, that convey meaning and thoughts and, and perform functions. Um, and so when we find uh, artifacts in the natural world, in the, in the world that we did not create, that we know only arise from minds of the kind that we have, we can infer that a mind w w possessing those capacities that we know was responsible. Now, that's what we can know scientifically. Um, I am a theist. I have other reasons for being a theist, and I have to distinguish between what we can know scientifically through the inference to intelligent design from broader commitments that, that a, uh, a, a, a typical Judeo-Christian would make about the, about the nature of God mm. and the nature of, okay. of the, de the well, design. Well, let, let me allow Charles to respond on that. And Charles, a, a, a question that I think kind of ties into this and, in terms of what um, Stephen has just said there comes from Joshua on Facebook, who says, um, for um, uh, Charles, what Maya proposes is, is it not just like the SETI project, i.e., you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, looking for evidence of a signal, an intelligent signal, um, uh, an intelligent mind out there? Well, do you consider that project to be pseudoscientific as well? If you're saying you should only be looking for material causes, we, we, intelligence isn't allowed as a factor in, in the whole process. Well, I'll start with the SETI and then go back with it. Okay. Of course, what's happening with the SETI thing is they are looking for material evidence. So if, if you heard Shakespeare being sung beautifully from Alpha Centauri, you go, good heavens, there's something that is capable of singing Shakespeare from Alpha Centauri. Mm. Oh, wow, there it is. I recognize it because it's Shakespeare. I don't know. Mm. Shakespeare got evolved twice. I have no <laughs> idea, but there it is. So I don't think there's any, any bearing on, on, on SETI whatsoever. So uh, that distracted me, though, from the main point. Well, is, I, d I guess isn't the question about SETI more that, well, we, we, we allow ourselves in, in that particular area of science to look for intelligence. Yes, I, 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 I know intelligence. What, it, what it is. So, yeah. the, so the point is, if, if we heard the SETI signal, then we would presume that there was a physical entity somewhere that, was intelligent. that also had a mind yeah. that could produce the signal. Mm. So this is where the analogy breaks down miserably with the intelligent design thing. Is Yes, mind is capable of these things, but we build everything in a temporal spatial framework. Everything. So yes, consciousness and mind builds these things, but we build it. And so the question is, how can it be built? Where are the factories? What is the signature? And so, of course, it goes back to the question that, that, that your, your, your listener 
rang in, which is, what well, does that mean that the intelligent designer is an animal? Yeah, so the yeah. question is, at some point, there has to be a corporeal body in order to do the designing if we're going to do this in a scientific way that operates in space and time. And intelligent design hasn't been able to point to any of those things whatsoever. Uh, uh, it's it's a, just the, a, a disembodied notion of consciousness and mind. And the whole point of the Darwinian revolution, the whole point of it, which made Darwin so hesitant, was the fact that natural processes were capable of producing things that looked like, superficially, things that humans make. And yeah. as I've argued, it's only superficial. And when you get into the details, my word, they're fundamentally different. And just to, to follow up on that then, Matt Crump asks this, and I think it also ties in, um, to Charles, at what point would you accept the slightest possibility of intelligence acting to produce what we recognise as DNA, the software blueprint? You know, it, are you fundamentally closed down to any possible kind of evidence that could suggest something beyond purely material yeah. processes? That's a beautiful question. That's a beautiful question. And so I want to distinguish between a little bit of subtlety of science, and I want to use music as an example. When you think of a musician, a musician is someone who plays music. They take the sheet music and they play it. And then there are the composers who are creating the music, and they do it in a great variety of different ways. But in the end, you're judged by the sheet music that you produce that you can then, as an object, pass on to the orchestra to play. So we need to distinguish very carefully, and, and Stephen has done this as well, between the sheet music, the scientific understanding, the legacy which we hope to leave to future generations, and the process by which we create that object, that objective knowledge. And so for me, as an individual scientist... One of the reasons why I read Stephen's book is, well, let's see if he can make some arguments that given my scientific understanding of genes, the Cambridge explosion, the fossil record, might lead me to think, good heavens, maybe there is a grain of truth in there. Let's see. Let's explore it. And so I'm fundamentally open to all sorts of new ideas. But, but you just don't stuff. believe you've, you've seen the evidence for that. Well, Stephen, um, we are running short on time now. So I'd like to yeah, start to address this area with you. Intelligence, um, what, what do you, first of all, respond to well, Charles there? Well, a couple of things. From the, the, I, I think that what we know from experience is that minds generate information. Whether the mind that generated the DNA was embodied or not embodied is not something that we can necessarily tell. Uh, a disembodied mind is something, if we think of God as spirit, it's certainly a plausible concept. But I, I'm not trying to argue for God's existence. I'm arguing for a mind. The attributes that, that provide the causal, the causal attributes, the capacities that minds have, it's not my fingernails or my, my, uh, my, my physical substrate. There's something about a mind that it, the, the reason that we have, the capacity to imagine, to envision uh, things in the future that aren't yet, imagination, all these endowments that we have as minds are, are things that are very difficult to, uh, to attribute to a material substrate. But maybe the mind was embodied, maybe it wasn't. What from the science we can tell is that we are seeing evidence namely information-rich structures that we know from experience only arise from intelligence. If you go into the British Museum and you look at the Rosetta Stone, uh, you, it would, someone, you, you, and said, gee, isn't it wonderful what wind and erosion produced? We would think that person daft. But what, and, and this is where I think your, your, your questioner's question is so apt. We do recognize the, the, the attributes of intelligence in many other fields of discourse. In archaeology, the SETI research program is a good example. Information is taken to be a distinctive hallmark of intelligent activity in all these other realms of experience. But in biology, we say, no, we can't go there. And I think this is where I think Charles is actually revealing that he has some deeper metaphysical commitments of his own. Uh, the, the, the move he made in the review where he said, gee, these developmental gene regulatory networks, uh, yes, they, they, they can't be perturbed, but they must have been perturbed in the past is a way – it, what, what he ends up doing there is he ends up jettisoning the basic principles of the historical scientific uh, method where we're enjoined to look for causes now in operation. And since we don't have causes in operation that can produce the kind of complexity that we need to build a body plan, the informational complexity, the circuitry, etc., we say, well, maybe things could have been different in the past. And I think what that be, belies is a prior commitment to at least methodological materialism. And what we're doing in the ID movement is saying, hey, let's not limit ourselves to what 
uh, to just materialistic explanations. If, the, if we have the right kind of evidence, the kind of evidence that we know from experience always indicates the prior activity of a mind, let's allow ourselves to consider that as a possibility, in part because it provides a better explanation, but it also may lead to real advantages for science, because okay. if life is a design system, it's going to look different, and it will lead to different experiments. Um, you, you, you claim, you, <clears throat> there's a contention there from Stephen that you're saying uh, it could have been different in the past. In fact, I sometimes hear that sort of criticism uh, leveled at young Earth creationists who, who use an argument, well, we don't know what it was like, you know, back in, you know, further back when perhaps the uh, decay rates were different and, and all the rest of it. Um, same kind of criticism being directed at you there, uh, Charles. What what do you respond? Um, are, are you jettisoning, as he says, these these rules of um, uh, modern rules of science and so on? Yeah, well, I'm going to go back. He's got things historically wrong, which is a little unfortunate, and 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 he's also, as a non-scientist, misunderstands the process. Where the composers, the process by which we compose is is difficult to understand because each of us does do it individually, differently, with different motives, different backgrounds, theistic, non-theistic, Christian, non-Christian. We don't really have rules which we have to adhere to like a lawyer to establish reliable maps into the past or into the future or describing the present. James Hutton is the one who established in the geological sciences of which Darwin was trained the principle of uniformitarianism that says that the processes that operate in today are key to understanding the processes that operated in the past. And so as I've indicated, life is an unfolding. If you take a chick egg, it starts off as a single cell and finishes up this remarkable object, a chicken. So it unfolds. And so the things that you can perturb early are different from the things that you can perturb late. So there isn't a single scientist that I'm aware of that doesn't think that as life unfolds from things where there are no multicellular organisms, that the rules of direct interaction and interaction are going to be different. So I've already dealt with this earlier in this conversation. It is completely bogus to say that if I try to manipulate the gene regulatory network that's the heart of a body plan of an existing phylum, that that has any bearing on what gene regulatory networks were capable of doing before there were established body plans. End of story. Okay. So it's very, very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah. we have a clash of crossing, <laughs> ships crossing in the, na- in the dark where I have a, what a I'm, temporal view let, that unfolds. Okay, quick, quick word from Stephen and we'll start to yeah, wrap things what, up. What I'm saying is that the, the, the primary epistemological commitment of the historical scientist is to allow what we know best to tell us about what we're going to infer about the past. Nature tells us that you can't perturb the central control elements of DGRNs. But since we know those systems, but, but you're saying since we know those systems, you, Charles, are saying since they have to be malleable to build new body plans, then they must have been malleable in the past, even though the experimental evidence says the opposite. I'm seeing this in a lot of evolutionary writing, where there's a, where we, and people even saying I'm an evolutionary non-uniformitarian, jettisoning, jettisoning what we know best in order to preserve a speculative hypothesis about the past. And I think that's, that's got things backwards. And I think that that's actually a tacit admission, especially in the case with the DGRNs, that nature and specifically biological systems aren't behaving as they would need to behave for macroevolutionary theory to be plausible. Well, we are going to have to start to draw it to a close. Charles, do you want to just, in, in a very quick nutshell, um, draw up how you, how you feel at the end of this, this uh, wide-ranging debate today? Well, in some respects, I think I think we are, in fact, where we were at the beginning, <laughs> which is which is Stephen has written his book, and I've written my review. It's it's not a book length because I didn't write a book length review. That we have different um, starting points from both what constitutes explanation, what the social nature of science is, and I mean I disagree completely with with Stephen with uh, his characterization of my argument. Um, and so I, I just, the, the frustration I have is that rather than pursuing the leads, he's satisfied to stop. And so I'm going to finish up with a last little example. In his criticism of my review and in his book, when he talks about the origin of new genes, he talks about lysyl oxidase and points out that that's a very important gene that arthropods, that is flies and trilobites and things, need to make their skeletons. And so it looks like a brand new gene comes into the existence of that phylum. And so 
a scientist would have said, hmm, that seems to be a problem. Let's explore that a little bit further and see what happens. And so I did that. And what I found is that it's four copies in humans, all animals. Good heavens, it's also in yeast, fungi, mushrooms. So it turns out that this key gene that seems so important to Stephen in the establishment of an arthropod body plan turns out to be pre-exist animals by a long shot. It's been simply co-opted to stiffen the collagens to lead to the chitin. And so then you get an amazing insight. Wow, I see. A lot of things that make us different are actually just different tweakings of things that are common for all the different organisms. Isn't that incredible, the commonality of all the diverse life we have? That's an insight, a, v a valuable insight. Where Stephen just stops and says, oh, there you go, there's too much information, it's too hard to evolve. Aha, uh -huh, I see a signature of an intelligent designer, but I can't tell you anything about it, where he operates, how he operates, what the rules are. All I can do is have a weak analogy to things that humans make without offering us anything in terms of what's actually happening in the distant past before there were Homo sapiens. We've had a very spirited uh, engagement. Thank you very much for your part in it, Charles. I uh, do appreciate you coming on and um, uh, all the best as you continue uh, teaching students and uh, I'm sure uh, supervising PhDs and all sorts of things over at Berkeley. But um, thank you for being on the program today. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, um, again, a very quick uh, summation uh, from yeah, you yeah. as we as we conclude the program. You bet. Um, I think Charles took my use of that protein out of context. I was simply showing that uh, that the organisms have parts lists, and the parts lists have to be built by proteins. And I acknowledge that if uh, he wants to push the problem of the origin of information back into the Precambrian, he's free to do that, but that is not solving the problem. That's just begging the question. Notice the question that he didn't answer, which is wh what is the origin of the genetic information necessary to build that protein? Some proteins, he acknowledges, arise with the Cambrian animals. That's why he talks about the need for genetic novelties. Some, he says, must have preexisted them in this pre-adapted Precambrian gene set. And that, I think, is the fundamental scientific issue. What is the origin of genetic information? He doesn't really answer that question. He just presupposes but doesn't explain two sources of information and the, 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 the information that arises in the Cambrian and in the Precambrian. I want to say that, that that information problem, which is unsolved within a materialistic framework, has a ready and obvious solution because of what we know from experience about what it takes to generate information, and that's intelligent design. All right. Thank you very much for being with me on the program today. Uh, don't forget, if you want to find out more about the book, well, of course, you can go online and, and order it. Um, and I'm, of course, going to link as well to Charles's review and, and other things as well from the, the website of the program today. In the meantime, thank you very much both to Charles Marshall and to Stephen Mayer for being my guests on this program today discussing intelligent design. You're unbelievable. <laughs> If you want to check out the show online as ever, go to the website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. You can find this show, download many past shows, subscribe to the podcast and much more. And don't forget, of course, you can uh, also interact via our Facebook and Twitter accounts at UnbelievableJB to follow me on Facebook, facebook.com slash UnbelievableJB if you want to like the page and get regular updates. Thanks for listening to today's programme. Look forward to hearing your responses as well. You can email unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Coming up next week on the show, an exciting lineup of guests discussing the morality and history of the Old Testament. It's all because of the new Bible TV series, which begins airing tonight on Channel 5 here in the UK and throughout the rest of December. Well, I can't tell you at this point exactly who'll be with me, but I can assure you it's looking like an absolutely stonking show. So I hope you'll come back for that same time next week between 2.30 and 4 and online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable if you're staying here on premier christian radio i'm going to be talking to pete gregg the founder of the 24 7 prayer movement